Adultbrain.ca. That's A D U L T B R A I N.ca. The Foo Fighters, they just did that film, 666. It was like some movie about, like, it was a joke about them worshiping the devil and them all dying. Just released, like, three or four weeks before that, before Taylor Hawkins died, and he was the first one to die in it. Okay, guys, welcome back to Grammar America Show. We are going to be chatting with past guests from episode 277. Shannon Taggart is back. Uh, to talk about her new book. It well, new it's book? coming out. I mean, it's not out. She's doing a new book. She is doing a reprint of hers, but we were just talking about spiritualism in general, really, and about this place in Northeastern USA that had all these sort of religions pop up. That seems very strange. So yeah, I kind of just hidden sort of spiritualism in general. There you have it. The new book comes out in the fall. I think that's what. Yeah, that's it. right. Yeah. 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 But I mean, it's still cool. Check out the seance in general um, at shannontaggart.com. I mean, it's like a picture book. It's got pictures and art about uh, ectoplasm and spiritual manifestations and stuff. So materializations. They haven't materialized some shit. So what are you been up to over there? Uh, done quarantine yet? I'm just reading this book on the supernatural. Are you done the quarantine? <laughs> I don't know. Am I? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. You're out. The app doesn't work. No, I know. I it's a piece of garbage. It doesn't work. It's just unbelievable. It really is. It shows you how, how awesome our government is when the app that they want to track you, it doesn't work properly. It really I'm stuck is, on the so. day eight. I'm stuck on the day eight. <laughs> You're still frozen on day eight. You're just in perpetual quarantine. Yeah, I get the emails all the time, man. You're on day eight. <laughs> No, I think it's, I don't know if it's actually officially the quarantine or just because they don't think I tested and yet I did test it. So that's the ironic part of it is I went and spent $200 on a fucking test and they don't think I did. So Why that's you, the frustrating part. You just, did you, do you have your results? Yeah. I'm going to need a copy of that. <laughs> okay, we'll talk about this after. We'll talk about this after the, after the show. Speaking of traveling, though, and contacted the cabin, let's throw it out there now because we want to get gain. We want to gain some interest. Uh, Gab or, and Dana or, sorry, sorry, want you to gain. have a have a call in show for the people that went. I told them I'd get you to reach who, out. Who does? Uh, Dana, Dan, Dan, and Dan Dana. wants me to have a call in show. Yeah, from the cabin. Wants me to have one. Well, he wants you, you to. Went? Yeah, he wants he wants us to do it, and I told him <laughs> that you had to figure it out. So. <laughs> I I said I'll get Graham to deal with that shit. So you could deal with it. I mean, it's not a bad idea. We could use the extra episode, and it could probably uh, you know promote the CAC. So he's good to promote the CAC. Yeah, I just have a thing about calling shows. I just don't, I don't, I don't well, like it. Might so be much, you could like I mean, it'll set be easier it up if it's all that way. Yeah. 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 There you have it. So, as of well, right now, I should mention there's a private room for Montana event, which is otherwise sold out up for resale right now. If anyone wants to grab that, head over to contact at thecabin.com, click on the Montana tab, grab that. And you can come. It's only in like five weeks we're going to and, tours. And this will be the only six-day Montana tour. We cut all the tours back to five days because uh, six days was just too much for Randall. And so for is, all of yeah, us, let's, to be honest. Let's, I mean, mention long that. Rand, let's mention that. Randall Carlson, first time in doing a tour with guests like this, people like this in Montana for that part of the flood, the flood, the mega floods. That's right. That's two days in Bonners Ferry, Idaho. And then four more days in Polson, Montana, nice little resort. Natasha and I went down there, had uh, had lunch, checked it out. Uh, feet back in my shit. That must have been back in December now, beginning of December, maybe late November. So uh, it's a nice little spot. Of course, I love Montana. I'm stoked to get down there for a couple of days and and poke around and do some exploring with Randall Carlson, Randall motherfucking Carlson. 
And if you can't make that one because it's kind of coming up quick, there is two of the the Randall Carlson Scabland tour with Randall himself and Brad and the Snake Bros and Grand America. I'm sure I'll be there in and out over the two weeks. There's two tours. Um, one's from the 19th to the 24th and another from the 26th to October 1st. So, I mean, if you guys want to get in on that, there's none. And then that's the last time that's in the fall, too. In 2023, those switch around. So come 2023, there's uh, the Scablands tours in the spring and the Montana uh, tours late fall. Not late fall, early fall. Last and then Brandon Powell will be at all of those, right? And Brandon he's at the Powell's one in June, all, right? Yeah. And he's at the one in June. So we're doing breathing and maybe some Wim Hof in, in some of these uh, areas. Oh, yeah, for cold. anyone who wants to. We never get going yeah. too early with the Randall Bunch, so there'll be plenty of time for that. Now that we've got this, uh, we got the stock pool, so I could take that down. We really should just get a company truck. Yeah, uh, yeah. We Even can. A company van, a camper yeah. van. Because you got the stock tank to take down there. I could take it down there, but I don't know if I'll, I probably won't be down there when it's over. Yeah. Anyways, yeah, we'll figure that's out an it. internal problem, not your problem. We could just buy another one. They're only 100 bucks. You're talking about those big metal tanks to do yeah. cold plunges in, right? Yeah. I kind of like that better than the kiddie oh, pool. Yeah, the kiddie pools are tough. To yeah, tough the, to use, the yeah. metal thing is way better if you can get it down there. I could yeah. give you my truck, but. I'm too chubby and I keep floating in the kiddie pool. I can't get under. <laughs> You're muscular. You're not chubby. You're making that CSI swag. Get yourself a muscular shirt. Anyway, so there is those Scavlands tours coming up. And I mean, what's the. the uh, Magic on the Mountain is about probably only, a, a you know, there's plenty of spots left for that. There's about a dozen spots gone. That's Shasta, Less right? That. That's Mount Shasta. I got... In uh, February? Yeah, I got Oliver Twist heading over now to go scope out the exact hikes we're going to do on the two mountains that are there. One Shasta, and then there's another one too, maybe, maybe Lanier or something like that. There's an L Mountain that's right there too, anyway. And then the flex day, people will be able to go to Shasta if they want a second time. And then Owen has said what he's doing. Um, it'll all be on the website soon, but he's doing his happiness thing. And Joe will have his thing. We'll have a bunch of the cold training out there for sure. It'll be February, so there'll be plenty of it. And then uh, the Utah 420 event is flying off the shelf. Uh, contact at thecabin.com. Get in on an event that Utah... One is going to be a blast. We'll be incorporating the side-by-sides. So uh, when people get there, if they want to be able to rent their own. Does that include the flipping of those? That's only if you're in mine. <laughs> get flip. And uh, I still got my deposit back. So, yeah, well, it'll basically be if you want to ride along or drive ours once in a bit and do that. You know, you can do that for free. You can just, that's that's fine. Um, but if you want to just get your own all day, you just have to rent your own because, uh, and uh, a couple people did that this time, or at least Michael did, but, uh, it was a blast. It really was a blast. Lots of trails around there, right? Oh, you could just go all day. We should get back out. I got the new dirt bike tires coming in. I'll pop it on for you. Way we go. No, you're done. We'll see. One and we'll done. See. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One and done. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't like getting videotaped riding a dirt bike. You can I had ride bad the quad. experiences when you I was younger. Ride the quad. I, I don't really, I don't really, I don't really resonate with the bikes. To be honest you with you, you could ride the quad. Yeah, the quad maybe. Yeah, quad. I would rather just do the quad. I, the bikes are just too much for me. I don't like it. <laughs> too out of control. It is pretty out of control. <laughs> it's too out of control. <laughs> But Especially think, when it's ice and water <laughs> with no and mud with no slick tire, like holy shit! We don't know winter where we get. I'm surprised it wasn't sore the next day. To be honest with you, I thought it was going to be a mess. It's good for you. So, but we should mention Canadian CAC as well because we do want to gauge interest. I mean, we wanted to like try to maybe have some. We're, 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 what it looks like interest is high. 
Yeah, I know when I started adding up sort of the local people that might come, it's it's it is getting to be quite a list. So I mean, we could probably have a pretty successful one somewhere close to Calgary or Eastern BC, right near, you know, near our hot springs or near a cold pool or, you know, in somewhere we don't, we don't know what we're going to do yet, but yeah, well, sort of in the two options right now are that we either go and, uh, we, we just like get a block of rooms, some at the Pomeroy where the Nordic spa is and everyone gets their own room, gets their own food which all adds up pretty quick too, or we just do like the style we do where we just get a big old Airbnb and we sell just a full ticket. It includes food. It includes the whole shebang. We get Brandon Powell out. He's dying to come up to Canada and do something. We could still do a day trip to the Nordic Spa. It's just in Canmore, right? There's some pretty dope spots in Invermere and a couple out around Cochrane that, uh, but are they're pretty limited. I mean, the problem is we won't build a camp. Yeah, yeah, that that is a big yeah, that's a big concern. Yeah, unless well, some of those places, like even the place we had in in Utah, is great. But the great room could be bigger. I mean, you know, that's the problem. Is it's a little get it does get a little cramped in there. You know, like it's hard to have a big event at an Airbnb unless it's huge. That one in Invermere had a bunch of spot. Is is pretty big. But it's pretty expensive. Yeah, then then that's the thing. Once you get that big, they get pretty expensive, yeah. So, so we need so, to we're, we're gonna decide in the next month or so and we're gonna give it probably at least, you know, at least tw- at least like it'll be at least either late next summer or next fall. Yeah. I mean Brad I think it'll end up being in November. October November twenty twenty three, right? Yeah, no October yeah. or November twenty twenty three. Yeah. Uh, because we won't go to Egypt two years in a row, right? No. Uh, no, that's too much. Egypt sold out with money, deposits. So you can still get on the wait list just in case someone backs out, uh, which I, I still. And that's can... November 2022. Right? Yeah. That's coming up fast. I guarantee you some people are still going to back out. I guarantee it. So it's worth, if you're interested in it, uh, you can go over to unchartedx.com slash tour. Or you can get there through the contact at the cabin page and get on the wait list. uh, Because like I say, uh, I'm sure somebody will, uh, a few people will back out yet. There's still, the deposit is still only a chunk of the money and things happen. There's always people backing out of the CAC events last minute. So it's nice to have a waiting list of people to get to. So get on there. But yeah, Egypt is sold out. I mean, it's only what, seven months away now? Six months. Six months till Egypt. In six months, we'll be getting ready to go to Egypt in a couple of days. That'll be wild. You've been there, but I haven't. That'll be my first time over the pond. Oh, wow. We're contemplating uh, maybe just spending an hour. Like, I still think we could go out on the 10th, do like seven hour flight or to, uh, to London. To London, spend the night, maybe do a thing on the 11th in London, and then fly okay. to Cairo in the morning of the 12th. Like a UK posse contact in the UK? How long would it take to drive from London to Cairo? Oh, dude, it's a it's a long ways, like a week probably, more or something than, like that. More than yeah, two days. I drove back. <laughs> I drove from I drove from Cairo to I drove from my. That would be a dope. Uh, I, I, and and my our car ran out of ju- like everything in juice, Amsterdam. Gas. Juice, everything, everything. No, dude, it fucking fell apart in Amsterdam. Like it, we we basically rolled it up to the canal. We were gonna just drive it right into the canal. I think we just left it in Amsterdam. So we can't do that then. But we drove from Turkey through Greece, Turkey, not quite from Cairo, but from across the Mediterranean all the way up to the Eastern Bloc in Germany. And that yeah, was crazy. Yeah, in this in this Ford station wagon that we slept in. We could probably get a hotel close to the airport for a couple of nights so and do something maybe on that night of the eleventh. And I, I don't know if because we could, I was, or if you could probably do it in four days, I guess, or something. But yeah, you, no, you, that, well, but this, you can't drive to Cairo, though. I mean, well, you, you can't. Yeah, you have but to drive through Israel. I'd like a day, dog. a couple days to decompress, and we might as well just do that in London. 
It would give well, us a chance to, to meet, meet a, a bunch of friends in London. I mean, yeah, we won't be able to do a whole cack yet, but we can do a like hang. You know, maybe there's a pub or something we can all meet up at. Or yeah, you guys tell us. We won't want to be more than you know ten or fifteen minutes from the airport, probably, because we'll have a flight on the morning of the. 12th. So email Graham at Grahamerica dot dot com and um, let me know if for you're- both of those. For the UK posse, and the Canadian. If you're interested in that, and the Canadian posse. Or if you're interested in a Canadian CAC, if we can get, you know, at least 12 or 15 people willing to pay the ticket price, which won't be crazy. Um, you know, I'm probably thinking it'll be probably in the $1,000 range. And uh, we could do the food and the whole shebang and get Brandon up here and... Uh, and maybe some other get, local guests. I mean, we yeah. have lots of local guests. We could yep. do some stuff. Yeah, We got some local people that could do some cool stuff too. So grammaracamerica.com. Let us know if you're into that. Contact at thecabin.com to get in on some of that uh, stuff we've been up to. It's not a cult uh, yet. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's not a cult. It just <laughs> seems a little culty. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you got? Well, I don't know. I got an email that I want to read. It's quite a long one. And I got a, uh, you know, I got a, for the quote of the week, I have a, an excerpt from the book I've been reading, talking about Swedenborg and spiritualism, that kind of stuff that I'd like to read as well. It's the profound quote of the week. Darren, can you guess it? So the, the, the just the reason why I wanted to <clears throat> why I kind of highlighted this is it really astounds me how they they battle this battle that we're in right now against materialism, which I you know I'd say we're you know we're, on one level we're winning and the other on the other level we're kind of we're kind of losing. I mean it's it's winning. it's very <laughs> interesting, but it's been going on for so long, right? I mean the church like this book I'm reading the church whether it's the scientific community or the Catholic church just persecuting these people. I mean, the church, especially anybody that came up with, you know, a different Christian religion that didn't include the church, but included the proper, you know, the actual scriptures was just fucking persecuted. Like they would kill them, dude. They would kill them, fucking hang them, chase them down into the fucking mountains of Southern France. Is this I, I mean, quote? It, what? Is this no, support? sorry. I'm just okay, okay, okay. So it's just. Are you telling you know, me it, Monty Python is based on actual events? <laughs> Dude, it's it's unbelievable because we're going through the persecution right now. People don't realize that it's been happening for hundreds of years. I thought we grew up in a safe time in the 80s, you know, where we were sort of over all this, but obviously not. So. Well, it's less Kelly. Oh my God. I won't even go there. The review of the history of Swedenborg draws you from his biography <laughs> remarks with thousands are now making. So this is like remarks, which thousands are now making. So nothing is more evident today. So this is going back to the early 1700s. Nothing is more evident today that, than, than that men of facts are afraid of a large number of important facts. All the spiritual facts, of which there are plenty in every age, are denounced as superstitions. The best attested spirit stories are not well received by that scientific courtesy which takes off its grave hat to a new beetle or fresh vegetable alkaloid. Large wigged science behaves worse to our ancestors than to our vermin. Evidence on spiritual subjects is regarded as impertinence by the learned. So timorous are they and so morbidly fearful of ghosts. If they were not afraid, they would investigate. But nature is to them a churchyard in which they must whistle their dry tunes to keep up their courage. They should come to Swedenborg, who has made ghosts themselves a science. As the matter stands, we are bold to say that there is no class that so little follows its own rules of uncaring experiment and induction, nor has so little respect for facts as the hard-headed scientific men. Again, like 1700s. 
They are attentive enough to class to a class of facts that nobody values to beetles, spiders, and fossils in all time and place have found full of interest, wonder, or importance. They show them a deal, a deaf, sorry, they show them a deaf ear and a callous heart. Science in this neglects its mission, which is to give us in knowledge a transcript of the world and primarily of that in the world which is nearest and dearest to the soul. <laughs> You're not reading a book here, buddy. <laughs> I can see your hand going. You're like Shakespeare. <laughs> so, Anyways, that's from that's from the history of the supernatural volume the second. It should be coming out on audio pretty soon. But I don't know. I just check out all I feel like that's very contextual, right? Yes. Check out all the audiobooks. I kind of zoned out. Uh, adultbrain.ca to get History of the Supernatural Volume 1. Get all prepped up for, for Graham's Volume 2. I mean, you must be one of the most read people on, on Audible. You're getting up there. <laughs> no. You're getting up no. there. You got th- I bet you're closing in a thousand hours. Oh, fuck yeah. I've done a thousand hours probably. It's, um, I don't know if you've done it yet, but you're getting there. 30, 30, 30, 100. I mean, you're really getting there. Close. Maybe they'll send you a little something, a little like gold uh, thing. No. I get a little piece of it. You can have the bottom half. I'll break the top half off. So uh, I forget what I was going to say next. But yeah, adultbrain.ca, if you want to check out those audiobooks he's spouting off about. Well, we talk about it in Shannon's episode, The History of Spiritualism by Arthur Conan Doyle is also out there. Right. What else? Yeah. Oh, that reminds me. I got suspended from Twitter. <gasps> what? I don't know if it's permanent. Dude, what? Elon's supposed to be free. People, Less people are getting suspended now than ever. Well, people are getting people are getting I unshadow think, banned. They're getting, I think more well, people bots are, are getting what? suspended than ever what? until Elon gets in. Maybe less. I don't know. What happened? What did you do? Now we've got a YouTube strike and you're getting suspended off Twitter. I mean, this is why we need support. Like it's not, it's not easy out there. <laughs> I, uh, I said that I hope that, uh, Justin's playing crap. Oh no. No, oh, you did it. Did you? Yeah. Why? Well, you don't well, have to advocate like violence. He's too. going to a war zone for a photo op. I mean, come on. It's unbelievable. He's going to a war zone for a photo op. Yes. And I even toned it down because I was like, I didn't say I hope his plane gets shot down because I was like, that would be advocating violence. I was like, well, I hope he crashes. Oh, that's pretty mean. Pretty mean. Yeah. You deserve to get kicked off for that one. What? No. (laughs) Are you advocating censorship? Speaking of censorship, your pro I mean, censorship. I mean, if it's, if off, it's, do you want me to if read it's this mean, email? If it's mean, it's okay to censor. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, you should see some of the I shit mean, that gets said. Obviously, it was a joke, chin. right? Uh, <laughs> totally joking. I mean, it's a joke because there's a bunch of other people on that plane that I don't want to crash. Maybe they can just push them out the back. But uh, I'm not saying that. I'm not advocating that. That's also a joke. Very unfunny comedian. But since when do politicians go into war zones? Just well, not- you know, he likes to do his photo ops. I mean, have you seen those memes with the photo ops? They're just priceless. They're hilarious. <laughs> He's like, I just want one like this. And there's all the people, all the people in the war around him. And he's like, just one more like this. And, you know. <laughs> I see you're a face he's paint got, enthusiast so just too. So, what? I see you're a face paint enthusiast too. Yeah, yeah, that one. <laughs> so, I mean, just so people know the contextual of this, I mean, he does literally have a photo op problem. I mean, he's got a selfie problem. He goes around to all these things, like including Indian graveyards and old, uh, you know, historic issues. He goes around to try and get these photos. It's, it's Residential the most political. Schools. He's the most political politician you'd ever fucking meet. It's gross. He got the photo off uh, of himself putting the teddy bear on the unmarked yeah. grave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, it's, but you know, it works for yeah. these guys because he's brainwashed half the country. I mean, they got a photo up with the Nazi flag. 
you know, for the convoy. I mean, they they literally set up a photo op just to just to use that, just like they set up this bogus study talking about how the unvaccinated are dangerous to the vaccinated. And if you want, if you want to that study debunked, which is the worst, it's the worst thing they could they could put out there in the media. Go to Dr. Byron Byron Bradle Byron Bradles his uh, his Substack, and he's got a great deconstruction of it. You're cutting in and out. I hope that's not happening while you're narrating. Yeah, I hope not. Can you hear Should that? No, I can't hear it. Uh-oh. Sounds good to me. Wah, 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 Anyways, I should probably wah, calm wah, down. Wah, wah, wah. That's probably why. You should why, calm you know? down. That's probably you're just all fired up. It's yeah. Sunday night. Yeah. You should Do you want me to read? Really, speaking I've of been censorship. Waiting for this shit to, it's supposed to rain all weekend. And it hasn't rained yet. Can I read this email? I could have yeah, been out maybe. doing stuff. All right, let it fly. So this is this is from Ben. Um, it's it's a little controversial, but it's he keeps it pretty good. I mean, it's a kind of an advertisement for our other show as well, Grand America Outlawed. Um, we had a show with John Lamb Lash. He says, uh, "Hey guys, excited but nervous about the trip in Egypt with COVID still swirling. Don't want to be disallowed in the country because of my status or having to mask up the damn in the goddamn desert." Had COVID this December down in Florida, and it wasn't too fun. But it Fake papers. It wasn't too terrible. I've been wanting to write you about this for a few years, but I didn't think you were at the point yet of being able to, to handle it. We're not. Perhaps you still aren't. <laughs> but here's a nudge regardless. Thank you both for bringing on John Lash. I've been following his stuff for a while now. I read his book. I've been on his sites. Have, haven't <clears throat> having got very similar messages from the mushroom. I was recruited by them 10 years ago and have been cultivating for the past five. John and I are bonded in soul and have received shared mushroom vision. So much of what he says lines up with my explicitly delivered lessons. I do have a few disagreements with him as well. Firstly, about the value of DMT, if not for the type of telistic shamanism he practices, then it's then for its healing properties, including championing fear, resetting and recalibrating the nervous system, and giving straight, firm, and concise advice. I do agree with his view of ayahuasca as being a healing plant spirit, but one that allows the archont- archontic virus to propagate whilst doing its work. The mushroom has made me intimately familiar with the archons and their physical, scaly expressions on Earth. The reptilian-controlled human is able to handle large amounts of ayahuasca, but would literally go completely unhinged, attempting to hold space with the mushroom in that way that John describes doing in the show. It will actually go insane before your very eyes and do everything possible to derail your journey to the luminous Sophia. I've witnessed it firsthand. At some point, I have to put together my experiences and observations in written form, As the mushroom has made it clear, I have a unique role to play in this. I'm half Jewish on my father's side and Swedish on my mother's side, which puts me genetically at perhaps one of the fulcrums of this greater battle. The reptilians, archons, isn't a descriptive enough word. They have such an obvious psycho-spiritual and physical expression. They're embodied now in all races, most ethnicities, and relatively consistently by the Jewish people. Did they originate with the Jewish people? Are they the first people to be fully embodied by this hive consciousness? No, their true ancientness is mind-boggling. I'm half Jewish. My wife is Jewish. My young daughters, 75% each. My wife and I are wholehearted revisionists. Imagine that. We have seen through our own intimate experiences with our families, our mushroom guidance, and the bounty of information available on the web now relegated to bit shoot and forums with all the other anti-Semitism. I'm happy to talk about this more in detail at some point, but this is the shit that gets you deplatformed for discussing. It really is. You get kicked off everything and banished to the dregs of the internet. So thanks for perhaps unwittingly allowing John on the program to broach this subject with people who have a lifetime of intense programming to avoid entertaining such an idea. For my young family, it's simply reality. And I'm getting so fed up with dealing with the in-laws that I might have to write something publicly just so they can shun us already and we can proceed happily along. LOL. 
<laughs> Anyways, the other thing I disagree with about John is uh, his avoidance of facing his shadow. While making the connection with the light of primary importance, reconciling the darkness is vital in order to cleanse and purify yourself to bring forth the message clearly. And John has simply not done a good job of that, letting so much anger fester, focusing too much on sex and women, as he alludes to in the interview, and generally coming across with too much ego. He's vying for a legacy, and he'll get one if he surrenders to his own message. This doesn't negate his accomplishments in the least, but sometimes you do have to separate the message from the man, which is hard for many people to do. A la Stephen Greer. <laughs> In any case, Outlawed is an opportunity for you guys to maybe delve into the whole revisionism issue a bit. It's old, but it's highly relevant. John has done a shit ton of research and can probably point you guys to a few folks to bring on the show if you'd be so inclined. I got what I needed to know a few years ago and I've moved on with my life. I now have two daughters. When you get the message, hang up the phone, as they say. But I would eat up any content you make on that subject. I'll say this. I think it's apparently hard to do objectively and not come across as a blathering racist. Every now and then you get a famous black dude to say something like NFL speeds for speedster Deshaun Jackson, and then they get vilified and have to go through a Jewish sanctioned re-education process in order to continue their careers. But it doesn't have to come down to some type of racial pride perspective, German pride, African-American pride, what have you. Unfortunately, that's how it's been addressed up to this point. Having feet in the Jewish camp, I can say that it's entirely possible to discuss this central issue and not have to yell out white power between each proclamation. Though it is awfully fun to intimate, imitate the famous Chappelle show Clayton Bigsby bit. The mushroom has shown me the magic and mystery of many races and ethnicities with more to come. The treasures and devils in the DNA and the sheer magnificent and relevance of all our differences. That said, some people work better than others at advancing their genetic agendas, and some of these agendas are not hospitable to, say, perhaps your own peoples. Once it's called out and exposed, the gigs are up. This is crucial, as is the delivery. It has to be balanced and heart-centered. You don't have to hate your opponents. You can simply do your best, truest self, and battle righteously and with honor, even if the other side plays dirty. MLK did it so well, in fact, that he transcended that issue, branched out into others, and the CIA had to shoot him to stop the momentum. You're hitting on gold mines here with Sophianic Gnosticism and the mushroom. If you can't get back to a centered, grounded place after discovering the depth of the conspiracy against humanity, you're as good as lost to the cause until you're able to do so. You have to be able to accept it. Who they are, multidimensionally, what they've accomplished, incredible feats, and what they plan to do the most sinister, sinister agenda you can imagine. And then tip your cap, give them a wink, let them know that you know, and then share that knowledge with others who are ready and when the time is right. Please do follow up with John and bring him back on the Outlawed Show. He can be self-centered, pretentious, and prickly, but he's mostly right, and right about some of the things that matter most. And, what's, and that's what I love the most, the truth, regardless of how it's delivered. Maybe you need that ego to be bold enough these days to go out and say the types of things that he says. People need to follow his advice with the mushroom. That technique is a revelation. The earth provides them in abundance. They're everywhere, accessible to everyone. They're completely democratic. No pilgrimages to Peru necessary. Graham, you're missing out on so much. Try a few mushrooms with John's method once it warms up or eat them and stare into a fire. You're due. Thanks for making these plus content shows. The China ones are pretty good too. You're honing in on some great stuff. Stay toasty up there. Ben in Florida. Toasty, toasty. Pretty good email. Thanks, Ben. I've been saving that for a while. Sorry it took me so long, but figured it's time. There you have it. It's time. Time to uh, support the show. America.ca slash support. Uh, in these troubled times, support is getting tight out there. If we get you guys to check your support, maybe it's falling off. It was an accident, but, uh, you know, like we say, these podcast subscriptions are the first things to go and it's a job for a full-time job for, for Graham. And we need to get that support up for America.ca slash support. Check out the outlawed podcast. Maybe you can sign up over there. Um, 
all that stuff is fantastic. Other than that, I think we've rambled on enough. Enjoy this fantastic. Go ahead. You got a yeah, bio. I'm just oh, here's Shannon's the bio. Shannon. Yeah, Shannon's bio. This is from her website, shannontegger.com. Um, and she became aware of spiritualism as a teenager with her cousin. When her cousin received a message from a medium that revealed details about her grandfather's death. In 2001, while working as a photographer, she began taking pictures where that message was received. Lilydale, in New York, the home to the world's largest spiritualist community, and proceeding to other such communities as England's Arthur Finley College. And I've got all, all links to all this stuff in the show notes, including these colleges and some of these things we talked about. Taggart expected to spend one summer night figuring out the tricks of the spiritualist trade. Instead, spiritualism's mysterious processes, earnest practitioners, and neglected photographic history became an inspiration. Her project evolved into an 18-year journey that has taken her around the world in search for ectoplasm, the elusive substance that is said to be both spiritual and material. So with Seance, Taggart offers haunting images exploring spiritualist practices in the U.S., England, and Europe. 150 of her original photographs, many of which have never been published, as well as rare historical photographs, supported with a commentary on her experiences, a foreword by Dan Aykroyd, and fourth generation spiritualists and illustrated essays from curator Andreas Fisher and artist Tony Ursler. And she examines spiritualism's relationship with human celebrity, its connections to art, science, and technology, and its intrinsic bond with the medium of photography. The book includes concludes with the debate over ectoplasm and how spiritualism can move forward, move forward in the 21st century. There you have it. There you have it, folks. Enjoy the chat with Shannon Taggart. Shannon Taggart, welcome back to Grey America. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Great to be back. Yeah, I'm really uh, looking forward to this conversation because you, I think, you know, it was a big part of, for me, realizing more about spiritualism after we talked, you know, the ectoplasm, the pictures, your your book, seance, it kind of reinvigorated Actually, it kind of just made me realize that there's more to the spiritualism than I thought back then. So ever since then, I mean, plus we've been reading books on spiritualism, so it'll be good to chat with you. But but I've learned so much since we last talked, so it'll be uh, really, really good to chat about it. How, how's right. your book been like the, since then? How's your journey uh, been since your book came out? Yeah, so um, I can't believe that the last we talked, it was before the book came out, but my, my book Sans was released in fall 2019 and it almost all the copies sold out as soon as it came out. So then, um, and then there was a pandemic, you know, oh, so right, right, yeah. I, I was actually very lucky. It was like the last season to get this book out. I've been working on it for almost 20 years by that point. So <laughs> I'm just thankful that I did get it out before the COVID craziness. But um, so it's been out of print for quite some time now, but it will be re-released this fall in a new edition uh, with a new publisher, uh, actually a Canadian publisher. Um, and so, so that's cool, but it's also like an interesting time to be speaking about spiritualism because of several things have happened since we spoke, which was, first of all, the Hilma off Klint um, painting show at the Guggenheim Museum. And she was a Swedish spiritualist artist who's now being reassessed as like a pioneer of abstract art. And 
the, her show opened in the Guggenheim and it was like the most well attended exhibition ever in the history of the Guggenheim. Whoa. The catalog is the best selling catalog. And so this appreciation for spiritualism in terms of like its links to modern art was unheard of when I started my project. And even right now, like as we're speaking, the Venice Biennale has a whole show about um, spiritualist artists surreal women surrealists but there's also a lot of seance photography in that you know so it's it's just a really cool i think in many ways people are reassessing spiritualism so it's it just kind of funny that by the time my book came out it, it was having sort of a cultural moment yes that's fantastic so let's just let's just summarize your book for for people because you know we have a lot of new listeners since four years ago on episode 277 was our our first episode together so your book was is like a um, it's called Seance, right? Mm-hmm. And it's yeah. it's it's got pictures and art, and you want to explain it a little bit? Yeah. So it's uh, I so I began I started it when I was working as a photojournalist, and now I would consider myself more of you know a fine art or you know an artist or a documentary photographer. Uh, but you know, I thought I would spend like a couple weeks in this quirky little town called Lilydale, which is the world's home to the world's largest spiritualist community. It's in upstate New York, not far from not that far from Toronto, actually. I, you know, it's it's sort of near Niagara. It's like an hour from Niagara Falls. Um and, you know, I, I thought, oh, I'll just spend a couple of weeks at this spiritualist town making some pictures and do like a straightforward journalistic project. And I discovered that spiritualism has such a crazy cultural history. And I just became really interested in the history. And then I found out that spiritualism has all this history in relation to photography. And I got really inspired by this outsider history or you know this this stuff that's been written out of history books and then i pursued the project for a number of years and so by the time the book was completed it was my photographs but also my writing and then also i have a number of essays that illustrate the history and there's a, like a lot of historical pictures as well and dan Aykroyd graciously contributed the forward so that was also very cool and you got some one-off pictures in there right that nobody has seen before yeah yeah there's historical pictures that no one's ever seen and um it was the there's like 150 of my pictures too and then i get to tell all the cool stories in the back there's some spooky stories in there too so, dan Aykroyd, the ghostbuster yes Nice. The Dan Aykroyd. I was trying to get him on the show for years, but I don't know if he checks his Twitter. Yeah, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, Ghostbusters, you know, the ectoplasma and all. I mean, that's just a real I tried to get uh, the other two Canadian guys on the show. Bob and Doug McKenzie? Bob and Doug, yeah. yeah. Rick Moranis and someone else? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think they're cool with our politics. No. (laughs) (laughs) But I digress. I was reading, so get this, Shannon, uh, today, this happens quite often, Darren's going to roll his eyes probably, but today I was narrating a book called The History of the Supernatural, book two, mm-hmm. and uh, the chapter was on spiritualism in America. No, I didn't cry. Oh. Um, you it was it's, something? So it's, yeah, it was, it was uh, the cha- I'm just looking for my notes here. The chapter was on um, spiritualism in America. And I mean, they're talking, they're talking. So, and I wanted to talk to you about this because we were going to, we were trying to get another guy to come on the show with us too. But um, Philadelphia, so back when it started in as early as 1852, but Philadelphia had 300 circles. And they say that there was 30,000 media in the United States. And then they said that uh, in, within eight years, there was 2.5 million people identified as like a, a, a spiritualist. It was, yeah, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. It's really hard right? to like, track the numbers. Increasing yeah. at 300,000 per annum. So, I mean, this book is an old book, but uh, it's so interesting how pervasive it seemed to be back then in the 1800s. Yeah, that's what I mean about history. It's like you really realize how the versions of history we are told differ, um, you know, by who's telling it. But at, at the time, like when spiritualism did erupt, it became so popular so fast and it was really giving 
people were suspecting that it would be the religion of the United States, that it would overtake Christianity, overtake Catholicism, like everything. And it, it's always been hard to track numbers with spiritualists because they're the essence of spiritualism is very anti-structure. It's very progressive. It's very individualistic. It's, it's, they don't have a dogma, you know, even within there's always, you know, spiritualism is, is kind of subjective to the practitioner. And a lot of people who are spiritualists don't even identify as spiritualists or, or people will go to spiritualist church, but not call themselves. It's, it's a whole thing that's very deeply ingrained in the spiritualist culture. So it's always been hard to track how many people are involved, but it was hugely popular, hugely popular. He said, he said uh, also, he says that this tour he found on this tour where he went around, I think it was was a Professor Hare himself. Somebody went on this tour. I probably should have taken better notes. He found that spiritualism was so generally diffused and every spiritualist, whatever his previous opinion on the subject, so invariably an anti-slavery man that he declared on his return that spiritualism would prove the death blow of, of slavery, that it nearly decided the presidential election in 1856 and decided it altogether in 1860. So, I mean, it had reached the, like you, you mentioned too, I think before is your, it reaches the, you know, the powerful people in government even, you know? Yeah. I mean, supposedly Abraham Lincoln and his wife were having seances in the white house uh, with members of Congress. Yeah. Um, That's what the the notes say. Uh, And, and, you know, my friends in Lilydale, I have a historian friend named Ron Nagy there who says, you know, uh, Lincoln is the only president who's not on record with what his religion was. So it leaves an open doorway. Was he actually a spiritualist? I mean, it would be very much of his time, but you know. So what do you think happened? Because I, re- so I also want to mention, I, we, we have out an audio as well, uh, the history of spiritualism. So not the history of the supernatural, which there's chapters. A lot of that is about spiritualism, of course, because it's sort of considered supernatural, but the history of spiritualism by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle. Mm -hmm. And he really does a good job of just going through the history of it all. I don't know if you're familiar with that book at all, but um, you know, I am, I don't know if I have a copy of it, but I did see that you have it on audio. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to listen to that. Yeah. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. And, and he, it makes me wonder what happened in the 1900s. Like, I feel like the, this came to a real culmination in the 1800s, even with powerful people getting involved, thousands of people in New York. There's people going to these circles all over the, the Northeast of the States, super popular. And then I feel like it just got, like, got shut down. Like materialism somehow won the battle in the late 1800s. And it culminated, culminated sort of in World War One, drawing, redrawing the map. But would, would, do you, did you see anything in your research that sort of, that sort of, showed the demise of of spiritualism amongst other uh, metaphysical modalities as well at the time? I, you know, I haven't done too much research on the demise. I would guess that, you know, spiritualism's always the, the main goal is to merge religion and science. And there was some real belief that uh, through new technology and the pursuit of spiritualism that they would finally prove the other world and then we could merge religion and science. And when that came became very complicated and very sticky, uh, I think people lost faith in spiritualism, but then it did have a rebirth after World War I because of all the death, you know, so... It, it kind of waxed and waned until I say I would say the real death knell for spiritualism is in the 1930s in between the wars. Um, but the beginning of spiritualism is really interesting because I think it does have to do with, um, you know, slavery and um, all these progressive movements. And you had all these new people who wanted religious freedom coming into New York state and spiritualism came about in this area of New York State called the Burned Over District. Have you ever heard of that? Just from the reading of your your email that I got, your newsletter uh, that I got. Oh yeah, so it's this really you know small area of New York State where Mormonism started, spiritualism started, of uh, the Seventh Theosophy. Day Adventists. Yeah, the Theosophists like. 
uh, it all kind of exploded in that area. And it's, you know, you got to think why, why there, you know, in all of history, there's no other religious history moment, like all these new religions prospered. And, and to this day, Mormonism is the fastest growing um, religion. I mean, more the Mormons succeeded. I don't really understand why. Exactly. <laughs> Cause but, they, Cause they're good preppers. Maybe. I, you know, I don't, I'm, I don't, I don't, I mean, I guess we could think on that. I mean, they have like a really strong hierarchy. Spiritualism was never, did not have a hierarchy, did not organize, did not build, build a lot. It was also always very progressive and very experimental and very loose. Um, so I don't know, but, you know, you think about, I think about the mes- metaphysics and they had recently ripped open the entire state to put in the Erie Canal, which the Erie Canal then through water connected New York State, you know, to the to the rest of the world, like to to the oceans, like things could come in on. But then it also it connected the rest of America to the rest of the world because everything came through transportation wise. And that's when commerce changed. That's when capitalism exploded. Like it's kind of like this revolution of lifestyle, really. It's a revolution of modern life happened there. So the, it, it's kind of funny that there's ex- the metaphysical explosion as well. Was it the same time frame? When did they do that Erie Canal? Uh, the Erie Canal was done by, I think, 1825. Okay, so and then... Yeah. The religions in that area had already, and then, you know, new people started moving in and clearing land. And then all those religions exploded within the next like 20 years. Yeah. That's so fascinating. It's, it's just really interesting part of history that isn't talked about that much. Yeah. And I mean, maybe I should even reword that because, because I mean, when thinking about growing up in the eighties and the nineties and now there's been a resurgence of the new age, which spiritualism is kind of a part of that. I mean, maybe, maybe it's more, maybe it's more accepted than, than I sort of think, you know, being in the bubble, but, but reading back to it, it just feels like it was, it was more popular back then than the new age is now, but maybe not. <laughs> May 17th, 1821 yeah, wow. was the first use of the Erie Canal. Oh. 584 yeah, kilometers long. Holy man. Mind you, there's got to be some length of canals running around Alberta. It'd be something to measure them out. That's interesting, yeah. It's crazy they were doing that shit 100 years ago. So, I feel so like they're not doing up, anything that, like up to that. No, That's no. like amount of productivity today no it's just like putting up more cell towers and new cell yeah 200 years ago now we're just like replacing cell towers every couple years and like so what did that do did that bring ocean water into the inland then is that what you're saying well i mean it connected through water to the to the hudson and then to the atlantic and then oh oh, that's interesting because water has all that memory and all that yeah i mean there's water as a psychic conductor but also you know, I, I was just reading recently. I was reading that book on Skinwalker Ranch. Uh, did you ever read that book? I've um, heard a lot George about Knapp. it. I've heard a lot about it, but I haven't read it. Well, there's a scene in where they they want to invoke like the paranormal at the ranch, so somebody can, so George Manap can see it. So what they do is they they rent a digger and they dig up some of the land because they said whenever there's construction or digging that's when the most psychic activity would happen. So then I just think like, oh yeah, maybe that theory about the Erie Canal, there is something to it. Cause it's not only water, um, but it it's also like digging up the land, like literally tearing up the earth. Um, there's something just really compelling about like thinking of the metaphysics of doing that. And it, it was an engineering like miracle. I mean, it was a really big deal that they figured out how to do it. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I like that. I like that theory. That's, that's great. I mean, who knows how many sacred graves and stuff they upended during that whole process or. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, it was all, yeah, of course, like, uh, American bound to hit one bound to hit one. I mean, yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and also I do think about water, water being a psychic conductor. So what do you think about the today's, like, what do you think about the acceptance of it now? Like have maybe, maybe we haven't, 
maybe I'm wrong about materialism and maybe it's it's still sort of controlling the paradigm, but maybe there's more people than we think that believe in the metaphysical. I don't know. It's hard to say. I Yes, I mean... I think that to think of that of our world as disenchanted is wrong. I think wherever you find human innovation, you find these ideas and you find the woo woo or, you know, I mean, especially like a lot of the, the, a lot of the big, um, you know, people who change the world are into very woo woo stuff. So, um, you know, I don't know. There's new brands of it. I think things get rebranded all the time. I think in certain circles, like in academia and the media, it's not that prevalent. But when you look elsewhere, it is. So, because Governor know. Governor Talmadge, so this would be in the 1800s, I believe. Uh, he was a United States senator, and and he he was one of the early converts to the new cult. So this is coming from the history of spiritualism from Conan Doyle. And it says, upon two separate occasions in two different years from different mediums, the answer in each case was almost identical. The first said, it is to draw mankind together in harmony and to convince skeptics of the immortality of the soul. And the second said, to unite mankind and to convince skeptical minds of the immortality of the soul. And I mean, we're all, and we're almost there, really. Yeah, Most people I mean, believe that. And that's, that is a good point because a lot of times, you know, people think spiritualism or spiritualists are occultists and that is one of their big distinctions. It's, it's very everything. So I I would define somebody or like a cult or magic as, as we're talking about here is it's a more active thing. Like I'm doing a, a ritual to change the world where spiritualism is all about doing a scientific experiment just to bring healing into the world and try to prove that, you know, there's more to this world, but not to go further with it. So they see themselves as like rationalists and as just obeying natural law, just, you know, kind of acknowledging an aspect of life rather than doing ritual practice to like change the world or invoke things or use spirits to do, to do their what they wish so it is it is very isn't, different isn't it a isn't there a risk though i mean because the other thing we've talked about since we last chatted with you is is you know and we've had lots of guests on that i kind of trust and i believe that have looked into a lot of this sort of occult stuff and and you know whether it's uh summoning this or that entity or even just searching for ufos or whatever that there's that there's a risk in you know what you're what you're sort of shining your light onto and what you're what you could be picking up. I mean, the you know the the early spiritualism seems to be sort of the start of like a Ouija board. You know, like I mean they're they're using different forms of that kind of communication with letters and bowls and all kinds of these things that ended up now Ouija boards. We know how crazy those are and how scary of a tool those can be. I mean, isn't there a risk as well? Yeah, you know, it's funny because Ouija boards are a spiritualist invention. Oh, okay. um, I think it was in Ohio. I don't remember Probably the year, Ohio. but sp early spiritualists did use I'll Ouija boards. <laughs> <laughs> early spiritualists did use Ouija boards, but now it's pretty much, it's not that common. And they're actually... If you talk to a spiritualist medium, they would probably say you don't need a Ouija board and you can get lower level spirits and you raise your vibration. You don't need that kind of a device. And people don't, they don't have a serious practice. They don't take it seriously. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're um, messing with. But yeah, spiritualism has like a, um, I guess, a different view. If you talk to a magic practitioner, I'm certain they would say, oh, protection is key and you do all this protection stuff. If you talk to a spiritualist, they would say, I don't try to mess with anything dangerous, so I don't need protection. Exactly. My intention exactly. is my protection. Your love, your loving heart and your intention. Yeah. 1886, yeah. 1886. in Ohio. Yeah. You nailed the Ohio. Spiritualists in the United States believe that the dead were able to contact the living and reportedly used a talking board very similar to a modern Ouija board at their camps in the U S state of Ohio in 1886 to ostensibly enable faster communication with spirits. 
Following its commercial introduction by businessman Elijah Bond on July 1st, 1890, the Ouija board was regarded as an innocent parlor game unrelated to the occult until American spiritualist Pearl Koran popularized its use as a divining tool during World War I. And then Hasbro got its hands on it. Well, the third thing when I typed in Ouija board was Ouija board Walmart. So that's, that's where we're at now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to have lots of crazy questions for you because we're, I mean, because this has been just on my mind so much lately. Do you think that when you mentioned the, the death knell maybe in the 30s, like, do you think that the acceptance of the population has something to do with the phenomenon presenting itself at all? I mean, is, is a reason why it feels like it disappeared in the 1900s because we lost, but like you said, we lost faith in it. Yeah. I mean, I really think the failure of science to prove and also a lot of fraud was found and there were a lot of charlatans. There were a lot of people, um, you know, taking, taking advantage of people, you know, that, that runs rampant through the history. But Although the people who started the religion, that certainly wasn't what's happening. And, for the most part, I know that's the stereotype, but really, I mean, probably more than nine times out of 10 who I meet are sincere practitioners. They may be misguided. They might not be good at, at what they say they're good at, but they are sincere in their intentions. Can but. you can you restate that science statement on, on instead of the failure of science to prove it, a failure of science to accept evidence? Well, I, I guess it is twofold because, you know, if you talk to a parapsychologist or somebody who's actually read all the science, like I'm not a scientist, uh, but like, for example, J.B. Ryan, who studied ESP, yeah. people who know statistics tell me that his statistics are solid. And even, you know, there's a journalist who wrote a really great book about Ryan. I think it's called Unbelievable by Stacey Horn. And she says she I mean, she's a skeptic. She's a just normal journalist and said he statistically proved um, that ESP, you know, like uh, above chance that, you know, you that ESP is a force. I mean, and his statistics are solid. You can't discount his statistics, but still it, it's. That's not really part of mainstream talk of yeah, science. Yeah, exactly. That's it's just kind of discounted. That's what I mean. And yeah. What you always hear is Houdini disproved it all or Randy disproved it all, which is if you look into those histories, those are very murky stories. That's what I mean. It's like that the science was there. It's just they left it. The mainstream would leave that data out. I mean, they only accepted sort of what they want. The rest is excluded. But I also the, it's it's. It's not clean science because it's really hard. The repeatability of the, a lot of the experiments is not, it's not easy. And I think that is because this kind of phenomena is deeply tied to survival mode and deeply tied to emotions. So, sorry, what was the first part? Survival mode. Oh, survival mode. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. Like, so it's, it's sort of like trying to, measure you know you you can't really measure things that are deeply attached to human emotion in a lab very easily you know like sports performance or like love or manifestation you know, uh, yeah even like sexual things you you know you put that in a lab and it dies um yeah. so i think paranormal is more along those lines and that and that it's something that people access when they absolutely need it yeah. Or something that comes into the world when there's like a, a super need for it. Or the people uh, observing it are affecting it by their negativity or their disbelief. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's something very mysterious about it, but I think it's tied to survival and also creative forces mm. that are at work in the world. So it's something that's really hard to like put in a lab and repeat. I feel like, uh, I feel like the, 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 the growth of theosophy in parallel with spiritualism in the 1800s and not with it, like parallel, but not connected to it. I don't know how, I don't know how to word it. I don't really know this exactly, but I feel like there was a, a missed opportunity and theos, 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 <laughs> theos, look at this guy laughing like that. Eh? The theosophists kind of, 
just instead of instead of not worrying about what what spiritualism was finding, just accepting that they're finding something. Like I felt like like in in Blavatsky's books, they're like <sighs> it's almost an arrogant take on well. The phenomena is there, but it's not dead people. You know, it's it's just your access to whatever Akashic records or whatever sort of more Hindu sort of tradition would allow the phenomena to be. Like, who cares if who's right about what it is? Like, just team up and accept it that there's a movement happening that can fight against the materialist paradigm. Right. Well, I mean, I think Blavatsky wanted to take it further. So she's arguing, she's actually arguing for magical practice, which actually changes the whole environment. Like it's, it's, she kind of like takes it and then makes it into something else with theosophy. Right. But, but cause like, cause some of the phenomena was very similar though. If you read some of the books of the experiences yeah. that they had, there was stuff appearing and disappearing and uh, stuff being written and left notes being embedded in places like very similar to some of the spiritualist experiences uh, from mm -hmm. the 1800s. But like, why was there still such a division with like, would the, was, it, was the spiritualist fighting against theosophy too? And the, and the both ways. I don't know. I mean, spiritualists definitely fought amongst themselves too yeah, about like yeah. how to move forward. Even today, I mean, it's like, do we go back to dark room seances? There's a whole camp that thinks <laughs> yeah. that's the future. And then there's other people who are like, no, we just be in light rooms, you know, using the type of techniques that you see in the Long Island medium or any of those TV shows. Like that's the way forward. And there's no, they don't really have a dogma or a, theology so you find a lot of mixed teachings mixed in too like some spiritualists are also buddhists or some spiritualists are also there's a lot of former nuns and priests who are mediums um so it it just never took off as a full-born theology the way that mormonism did but then you know mormonism is also it's a form of christianity but it's also very magical <laughs> you know i so i don't know i mean i guess i need to know more about mormonism like and, and how they practice right now but. we used to call it mormon hold'em what does that mean i think it's they could have like multiple wives right I, that think, the like that? I, think, I don't know, I don't know. like that <laughs> That that, that sect like bro that? Brand, they broke. It's called I forget what it's called. Those are the ones polygamists or whatever or something like that. Those are the ones that ran down to Mexico, right? Yeah, yeah. Then they became Senators. like the reformed. <laughs> One of them is a, a senator. In so it's not like you know the main church in Utah doesn't practice polygamy. Man, you anymore. should see a lot of those. Uh, a lot of those. Whatever they're called, are they just temples? Yeah. Those white, yeah. they always got the white mm -hmm. shine and glow and white in the night. Mm -hmm. And supposedly they got stashes of food all over oh, the yeah, place. Oh, yeah, they're all preppers. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm telling you. They're super organized. I mean, this is, and that's probably something to do with the hierarchy you mentioned, but they've, they're have they super preppers. They know, they know, the shit goes down, man. The Mormons are the ones that are surviving. I'm telling we you. We got they're... some good, we got some, we, we got some fantastic Mormon listeners. We were just we in be Utah. heading down. To you, uh, shout out. We'll be heading down. You know who you are. We'll be coming. Shit goes <laughs> we, we were just he we were just in Utah, and I find that that state and some of the little towns there are so clean and organized. I mean, it it, it seems like if I don't know, it felt it felt good being there. So here's yeah, the, I heard it's beautiful in it, Utah. I've never been. Yeah, here's the holy huddle. What is Mormonism? Why can men have multiple wives? What are their beliefs? And what is the Book of Mormon? So I guess you're right. Maybe. So, but do you think there was a missed opportunity with theosophy and spiritualism in the 1800s? And I guess is just to, to finish that sort of thought. Like if you were, if you were back then, would you wish that theosophy didn't fight so much against spiritualism? You know, I don't know. I mean, I think theosophy though affected the culture in a lot of really important ways. I, I think this stuff is not for everybody. You know, I think for the most part, and, and I talk about this in the book, you know, when people are Christian and they say to me, 
you know, you should stay away from that or, or, you know, it's, it's really bad. It's really demonic or, you know, I respect that as a viewpoint. I'm usually when I get into the, the actual debate, it gets too in the weeds. They're, 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 their denouncement is just too broad. They don't want to really, really debate it. They're just like, no, it's bad. Stay away. And, yeah. you know, that can be true for many people. It's when you are, um, you know, mer- using your, not everybody can be a psycho knot. You know, you really have to destruct, you know, you really have to take your mind to another place. It, it can be like a drug. And it's like some, for some people, they have a psychedelic experience and it's incredibly healing. And, um, they can work with it and bring it into their lives and other people have breakdowns. You know, I, I think it's a process very similar to psychedelics and I, I don't think it is for everybody. So I don't know. Um, and most, most major religions have taboo against these practices. And I have to say that there's probably reason for that because it destructures things. You know, you find things like spiritualism and, Theosophy and 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 such like proliferates in liminal times, or you find it in times of change, or you know, very creative people are into it. You know, it's not like I said about the hierarchy thing, hierarchy and building society and all that. It's it's you know, maybe that's why the Mormons are successful because they are very much focused on like building and moving forward and building family life and having a hierarchy and. And so that grows and proliferates. But at the same time, um, I think people who discount wholly, you know, altogether, like, oh, spiritualism is evil, it's bad, or like, theosophy is evil, it's bad. I think it's a really, um, I don't want to use the word ignorant because it sounds really bad, but it's like not really considering. Well, it's, it's dogmatic kind of, I guess you could say. But it's not because like that this stuff anything creative that comes into the world is usually attached to such processes in some way, you know, like I'll, I'll, it's funny. Cause I, I'll see people who are extremely conservative and cons- extremely religious. And they'll say, don't even practice Halloween. That's evil, you know, but then they'll, they'll post like Led Zeppelin is the best band ever. And it's like, it kind of makes me laugh because like, Jimmy Page bought Aleister Crowley's house and wrote like how much, I mean, you know, and they like how much what was going on with that, you know, so that's like a creative act of music that was very much attached to the occult. So you can like listen to the music that's a like a but you can't cel- celebrate Halloween. Do you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, you it's can like listen to the darkest depths of Mordor. I met a girl so fair and the golem and the evil lord crept up and slipped away with her. You but, guys you know, Halloween's crazy. bad. I think people are just really um, disconnected to the how this all of these practices like mediumship and spiritualism are they're deeply tied to creativity and UFOs and all all the you know I would put it all in one big area the paranormal. Do you see any trends with the physical manifestations of uh, of the? Uh, ectoplasm or the the pictures i'm trying to remember there's another word for it um like the apparitions that kind of stuff oh yeah materializations yeah i mean all that stuff in my book i i argue that you know the spirit photography like the early stuff that happened where they were you were first seeing ectoplasm and materializations and all of that like i i you know without getting into the weeds about like discounting all of it, it's, it's symbolic. It's, it, it's visuals that extend the teaching of what they were trying to say, which is, you know, when you see ectoplasm, ectoplasm is a substance that's supposed to merge life and death in the pictures. It looks like oozing goo or, you know, in ghostbusters, it's show as it's shown as green slime, but like in the pictures, it looks like cheesecloth coming out of people or, you know, these wafts of, of material or, or such like that. But, and they look kind of silly, but the meaning behind them, it's a visual attached to a meaning, like a, a like a metaphysical idea. So I often say like uh, photography in spiritualism is kind of like 
painting in Catholicism, you know, all the paintings in Catholicism, you know, a lot of wild stuff goes on in those paintings and people don't pick them apart. We just accept them as a religious truth because they're painted. And I think it's the same with the crazy pictures of the ectoplasm and the materialization. There's like a religious truth in there that's trying to be expressed through this new medium of photography. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And I never thought about it like that. So, and then, because Orbs, you know, you mentioned, I, I listened to a great show of yours. Uh, you were with Jeffrey Mishlove probably about six months ago or something like that. Oh, yeah. It was a but, little and while you guys ago. were talking about uh, Orbs, how they show up for some people. And like, I've been, you know, looking for UFOs in a group and some ladies have Orbs showing up all the time in their in their photos. And I never, I never can, can see them or get them. Yeah, the Orb thing, you know, there's so much debate about, oh, it's Orbs dust or water or any of that and the from what i can tell and the practitioners i've met and the research i've done it that's really beside the point because the point is to interact with the orb it's to invoke it and then make it do something like have a con have your consciousness interact with it its appearance so uh, the same thing i never did orbs or anything and i was in italy at a spiritualist conference and the there was orb photographers there and they said okay, we're going to go do some orb hunting. And I said, you know, I'll go and I'll bring my camera, but I'm not going to get any orbs. And they was like, no, if we go to the mountains and we say our prayers, you're going to get orbs. <laughs> and so we went into the mountains and they said their prayers. And I took some pictures right after, and I got one picture that is just covered in orbs. Like it's, and there wasn't a dust storm. It wasn't, it wasn't bugs. Like nothing changed to my eyes visually other than the fact that they asked for the orbs before we walked into the mountains. So I, you know, I don't know. I love that there's some mystery to it, but I, I think the whole orb thing is really about your consciousness act asking for this visual to appear. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree. Yeah. Do you think that there's spirits in there? Like are the orbs, uh, do you think they're, cause I mean, some people see them all. I mean, we had, we talked about the invasion of the red orbs. No invasion of the, what do they call it? The invasion of the orange orbs. And uh, we just met some people last weekend and we were talking about how all of a sudden we're all in this, I'm in this room with about three or four people and we're talking about all the, the interesting shooting stars and orb sightings that we've all had. I hadn't had any of the orb sightings, but a lot of these people have seen orange orbs and one of our, guests had tracked them from the databases of the UFO organizations. And there's a pattern to the orange orbs coming from Catalina Island at 10 o'clock at night. And there are like three different spots where these orange orbs were traveling mostly at around 10 o'clock at night. And the guy's like, yeah, it's, I saw that orange orb at 10 o'clock at night. This was just last weekend. And, um, and he says they were cloaked there. It's a cloaking. Uh, it's a cloak for some sort of craft. But then I hear a lot of other people saying they're like, you know, lives between lives or spirits or, you know, living light beings, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, as far as um, I can tell, as far as spiritualism go and goes and orbs, a lot of it started happening with grieving mothers like ta trying to talk to their children with the the orbs. That's how a lot of it grew on the internet with these grieving mother circles, wow. which the grieving mother is an important figure throughout all of spiritualism. I mean, that's probably like the, the driving force behind all of spiritualism, really, if you want to break it down. And so there's a lot of grieving mothers online. And I've met a lot of grieving mothers who use orb photography. And then some of them will zoom in and try to see faces on the orbs and such but they try to call their children through the the orbs and you know there are mediums who have theories like oh yeah well that's how the whole orb thing started i mean i don't know i don't know where it all started but i did find a lot of that what, kind of interaction what about other phenomena that's like really famous in the 1800s from like table table turning and knocking and tables moving and i mean people were seeing like knocking in answer to questions all over the, the house. It wasn't just, you know, like under the table, but over the door and on both sides of the window. And, you know, is that, is any of that stuff happening in modern day now? Um, yeah. I mean, people still use tables and actually there was a really famous experiment called the Philip experiment. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. That? Yeah. But that like, was still they... a long time ago, wasn't it? That was in the seventies. Oh, it's, oh, uh, that's not too bad. Yeah. 
Um, I actually, I'm working on a new book uh, other than my, my seance book. It's about a table tipping group that was active for like 50 years. Wow, They fantastic. have lots of, lots of table tipping photos will be in that book. And where were they out of? It was a group that was in Missouri. It was started by the poet, John G. Nyhart, who wrote the book, Black Elk Speaks. Do you oh, know that yeah, book? Yeah. I've read it. Yeah, yeah. So the author of that book, his wife died in a car accident. And then afterwards, he started having like poltergeist experiences in his home. And so he started, he was teaching at the University of Missouri. And he started like a experimental seance group with some of his students. And it turned into this big, crazy story that went on for like 50 years but i have like all their photos and the notebooks and they made films and they i have their audio and it's like it's a really wild wild story but yeah black elk speaks is a great book too so it's kind of like the impetus of of the group interesting didn't we listen to that on one of our trips you were oh, yeah, I might have, might have made you listen to that at yeah. some point. Yeah, I don't know if that was the, so there's one that black does. I had both of them. There's a black elk speaks. And then there's one that he actually wrote. I forget the, the, the sacred pipe. The I can't remember. It's one black elk wrote. I can't remember what it was called. Mm. It's definitely a tougher read. Okay. Because uh, obviously he wasn't a writer. So. Well, he did. It was a yeah. writer because he wrote a book, but he definitely wasn't as fluid as Nyhart was, and English wasn't his first yeah, language. Yeah, I'm wondering and- if that that could be. There's a guy. There was an anthropologist who went and took all the notes and published it as a book. Yeah, that's that probably Nyhart it. used. It's that. It's that book. Okay. Because there's also another book called The Sacred Pipe that was written by another anthropologist after. It was like Joseph Epps Brown, I think his name is. That's another book, too, about Black Elk. There's also a great biography of Black Elk book by a guy named Joe Jackson. It's phenomenal. I think I might have read that one, too. But the Nyhart one was my favorite one. Yeah, it's a beautiful book. Yeah, the Sacred Pipe, Black Elk's account of the seven right, what does it say, the seven rights of the Oglala Sioux. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually pronounced something right. Book 36. Yeah. Book thirty six. <laughs> <laughs> so so the, so, and you think that, like there's definitely movement in the table, physical manifestations. Oh gosh, this story is so level ten bonkers. It's a. I mean, I cannot wait to have the book out, but it's not going to be out till like twenty twenty three. Yeah, well, we should we should go over that. We should have you on again when that book comes. Oh, out. Oh yeah, good. no, it's totally wild. It's. I mean, yes, they had, I mean, they claimed all sorts of things and every famous parapsychologist studied them and they they were on Arthur C. Clarke. They were in the National Enquirer. They were like written up everywhere. It it was, you know, the Randy um, James project. I don't know when Randy, you know, Randy, the magician, he he did this. Yeah, he did this big thing called Project Alpha yeah. where he tried to like bust the parapsychologists. That was part of this whole story. Wow. That'll <laughs> it's be like a really yeah, it's and the visuals are cool. So I will definitely I'll definitely get you guys a copy. It's really hard to believe how overwhelming the evidence I I think the evidence seems overwhelming over the over the hundreds of years that this has been happening, you know, that <laughs> Even they, you know, like they talk about the, these authors talk about all the scientists and and other people that went there to debunk it, and they changed their mind. I mean, there is a certain amount of these scientists that are like, nope, like there's something here. I came in to to sort of, you know, yeah, debunk it, and yeah. it, and I can't. It's, it's too much here. Yeah, and then you but you always get also too like accusations of fraud or like sketchy parts of the story and there are people who believe that psi has a hiding mechanism or that's like part of it like it tries to hide the trickster so that kind it can, of aspect. yeah yeah the trickster stuff so it tries to hide so it can proliferate that's yeah. interesting what do you what do you mean by so you mean it would hide from uh from 
being noticed too much by the population kind of, or like, yeah, if- yeah. Like it has a hiding quality, like, um, so, and so that like the real stuff, it, it, when the real stuff happens, it'll purposely have this element to also drive people away from it so that it can keep so, so the that the real stuff can happen. See, it kind of, that kind of reminds me of the theosophy part where they said the brotherhood, like that was creating all this phenomena in the invisible realm. I mean, that's, they're like, no, your humanity's not ready. Like we're, we're bringing it out slowly, slowly, but we can't just come out all at once. Cause you guys aren't ready. And then sure enough, like, half the people don't believe and half the people believe. And, yeah. You know. Well, and, and um, also there's theories that Psy takes the path of least resistance so that if you are in a situation where it's easier for somebody to cheat, they might just they'd be compelled to cheat. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen, like even in the Enfield poltergeist case, but there was tons of evidence that something real was happening, but also the little girl's, did yes, fake some stuff yes. and when they were interviewed about it they said i don't know why i did i was just compelled to like there's something very irrational that comes into it well there's also the ufo cases of those those famous uh ufo contactees in the 40s and 50s that it seemed to start out legit and then they started to fake their way out of it it's like they couldn't they needed to keep proliferating the phenomena no matter what it took or something Right. Like even after it, cause usually it, it fades away, it'll or start something. off strong and then fade away and then people will fake it. And then there's things like the Philip group where they said they were faking, but through the faking, they invoked something real. Oh my God. Because, yeah. Like a Tulpa type thing. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's all very interesting. Yeah, that's fascinating. I didn't know that about the Philip group. So they said they were faking it j- yeah, just part was, of the their, time. Their or whole the... goal was just to get together oh, to like, right. we're going to create a fake ghost. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. So part. It was like a psychology experiment, but they didn't really start getting um, anything happen until they all started like having fun with it and playing with it and stopped like, um, once you Being let really it go. serious yeah, about it. Yeah, yeah. And that's that easy, that's that least resistance path again, maybe. Yeah, but they wrote the, like, they wrote a fake bio for a fake ghost and then start, like, tried to invoke this thing and then created something that they got real physical effects with. Have you heard about some of these authors that their characters kind of end up coming to life through their storytelling um, and their writing? That is so interesting because this is a topic I've been researching. I keep seeing an orb go fly by your. Uh, oh, I know. I saw that. that. It might be a moth. Okay. I, <laughs> there's some moth that I'm trying to get rid of. But um, but go ahead because I'm also interested when that happens in acting and film, like when something is acted out and then it happens in the world. Yeah, yeah. But like I know Stephen King when he got run over by the car. He felt that that was one of his characters or like he kind of says that in that on writing book. Yeah. You know? yeah but yeah. but what are yeah. the, who are the other authors? Oh, no, I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I can't remember. It's been a few years now since I, since I learned about that. Yeah. But I was just listening to something about like Faye Dunaway when she played um, Joan Crawford in that movie, Mommy Dearest. Like everybody on the set felt like it was Joan Crawford who was there and like she would go home at night in her bedroom and could feel Joan Crawford in her bedroom. And like there's a lot of stories like that through acting that you you can find. Yeah, definitely. Even that Jim Carrey documentary about when he played um, Andy Kaufman. It's really fascinating. Yeah. There's some stuff about there's some pretty negative aspects too of the crow and some things where uh, the the actors die when the characters and all that too. There's a kind of I mean really that just happened with the Foo Fighters die Be- because they the the Foo Fighters they just did that film six six six. It was like some movie about like it was a joke about them worshiping the devil oh, and right. them all dying. 
And then that and guy it, died. It, it was just released like three or four weeks before that hap- before Taylor Hawkins died, and he yeah. was the first one to die in it. Oh, that's crazy. I haven't watched it. Um, no, either have I. I didn't even know about it until just now. <laughs> yeah. So. It's a, some movie where they're joking about selling their souls to the devil. I wonder if they did. And then they all die. That like imagine pretty... being the other ones. I mean, the world happens. where Dave Grohl gets to be a rock star. He must have made a deal with somebody. <laughs> it's just, it's just strange when that, like, when that happens, though. I wonder if he killed Cobain. What do you think? No, I no. don't. I, I did like that documentary, move. though. Kurt and Courtney, that the the did you ever see that one? Like Broomfield did it. That's a pretty. That's newer, isn't it? I should watch that. I haven't watched any of that stuff in a long time. Probably ten or fifteen mm-hmm. years since I've dabbed into that. I remember the. I think the last Nirvana thing I watched was like Live Tonight sold out or something mm-hmm. like that. Because you were a Nirvana fan, weren't you? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I was a Nirvana fan back in the day, back in the early nineties, mm-hmm. when I was a a, a budding teenager. Yeah, but I've been I've been meaning to like watch the Foo Fighters film just since, you know, it's just so weird. Yeah, yeah. Also, um Mel Gibson's Last Temptation of Christ, tons of weird stuff happened on that set. That's right, yeah. It's like I think the guy when he was on the cross got I think the cross the assistant director got struck by lightning, but there was two light I think the cross got struck by lightning too. And there was all these like on-site conversions to Christianity. And even the guy who played Jesus, he doesn't, he doesn't play anything. I mean, he's just totally Christian. Now? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. Does that's he still crazy. think he's Jesus? I don't know, but he doesn't take like regular acting roles anymore. I mean, it's hard to talk. I mean, you're a bunch of the son of God. Yeah, it's hard, it's, it's, it's hard to go yeah, back from there. It's hard to go back Hanging my hat on this. Call me Jesus. It's, uh, we had a synchronicity. Do you remember this one? A long nope. time ago, listeners send in their synchronicities, and one was a guy um, on a, on a, they were doing an a audition for a guy uh, that had a very specific tattoos, mm-hmm. um, a barcode and some other weird thing. And this guy came in to, so the really, I mean, I'm cutting through all the, like the details that probably helped the synchronicity out, but the guy that called in, he went to audition for this part and he had the exact tattoos that they were looking for and he didn't know. Wow. Yeah, it was pretty creepy. Did you get the part? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope so. I got oh, sorry. Well, was, we don't we don't like your smile or something after that. Yeah, but then you you know, in the paranormal, then there's also the question like, well, maybe that was a precog thing. Exactly. Yeah. When they called for those um tattoos, they actually like were pre-anticipating the guy and that's where the actual call came from yeah yeah that's the synchronicity debate is it precog or is it a synchronicity yeah yeah so what else uh do we need to discuss before we let you go about your uh your new book coming out or your sort of your re reprint or oh yeah so my reprint of my book Seance, it'll be out this fall. Um, I have a website, shannontaggart.com, and I have a mailing list. And I also host um, online events and a live event every summer. And that's under that's on my website. And then in 2023, I'll have my Sorat book out, and I'll have to come back on and tell you all about it. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think you'll like it as fans of Black Oak Speaks if- book. If people like are interested in spiritualism and maybe finding a circle or something, is there ways that people can do that? Uh, yeah, there's, um, well, there's a Nash in America, there's a national, um, NSAC. Um, so the national spiritualist association of churches in England, there's a spiritualist national union of churches in England. There's a great place called Arthur Finley college, which is like, this amazing um, spiritualist learning center that's sort of like Harry Potter's Hogwarts for adult spiritualists. There's also, there's a place called Morris Pratt Institute in uh, America that teaches spiritualism. Any local spiritualist church could 
set you up. And so you have to, I think that's the best place to go if you're interested, find a local spiritualist church. And they are, they're few and far between, but they're still around. Some of the Unitarian ones, I think, uh, have them come in. Oh, really? Unity, yeah, yeah, the Unity churches. I've seen, Mm -hmm. I've been to one that, a a spiritualist speaker in a Unity church before, so. Mm. Maybe, Maybe checking in with your local Unity church, too. Cool. Is that a thing? (laughs) <laughs> Local unity churches. Yeah, it's one in every one in every one city. in every city. <laughs> what about uh, you, Shannon? What can people track down your website, your social media, anything like that? Yeah, um, so it's my name, ShannonTaggart.com, T-A-G-G-A-R-T, and there's lots of links there, and there's a a thing to sign up for a mailing list. Also, I'm on Instagram. I'm not on Twitter that much. Um, but I do have an Instagram and I am on Facebook, but not on that so much. You got um, some great pictures on your website there. It's fantastic. Yeah. I, yeah. I have my, my website. I have like lots of links. There's also um, talks that I've done about my work. I have some links about that. I do. I did this big project about Michael Jackson. Uh, <laughs> that's like a work in progress too. Maybe we'll have to talk about Michael Jackson sometime. What, what tease us a bit. What, what's going on with Michael? Um, so it's just, it's about how he is the ultimate liminal figure. Cause he's black, white, child, adult, male, female, like young, old, uh, the whole man animal thing with his relationships. And then, um, there is this whole awake asleep thing and you know how he dies to like, it's very strange. So I just kind of break down all these opposites that he embodies, Interesting. And so that's like a work in progress. Hopefully that will be, um, I don't know, maybe a book. I don't know how that will live, but I've been working on it for a long time. So Right on. Cool. Yeah, let us know about that too. And yeah. Lilydale. Yeah. Is Lilydale a cool place to go visit? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's kind of like a time warp, but definitely feels like you're in another yeah. era. It's a little tiny Victorian cottage town that has been run by spiritualists since the late 1800s. And so my I do a symposium there every summer. So it's July 29th and 30th this year. And there's a really cool schedule up um, on my website on the events. Okay. So that's like a live event. So, you know, now that people are going out and about again... <laughs> Might as well go there. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Lily, Lilydale 2022. Awesome. Yeah. Right on, Shannon. Cool. Thanks. thanks. Yeah. This has been fun. Yeah. Okay, thanks well, for thanks for having me. I'll I'll keep in touch. Um uh hopefully I'll uh yeah, I have lots to talk about in the future. So right on. Yeah, and we'll let you know when this uh when this history of the supernatural comes out too. We're on book two. Book one is out, but book two is coming out in audio soon too. Well, All right. I'll Sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank awesome. you. Have Thank a you wonderful much. night. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. And that was our chat. Shannon Tag. four yeah. years later. What do you think, Yeah, buddy? that was good. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think? Good one. Fun to reconnect. Yeah. Chat it out. Nice to see more people doing events. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. Head over to contactatthecabin.com if you want to check out our events. Check out all Shannon stuff. Head over to her website. Ooh, geez, excuse <laughs> me. My, my. Oh, my. I had pizza for lunch. That's what I get. Uh, check out all her stuff, follow her on Instagram, and wait for a new book to come out. Yeah. And if check want, out our books on spiritualism. Check out my books. The History of Spiritualism. Yeah, and yours on Indians. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, episode 277. Yeah. If you want to check out our last interview with Shannon from back in 2018 before the world flipped on its head. Yeah, oh, by the way, if you're a Canadian and you're interested in the contact at the cabin events, let us know. A bunch of people were like, Asking me lately about a Canadian event. I'm guessing a bunch of Canadians that can't travel. Or uh, for various reasons. One of which I'm sure is the COVID vaccine requirements. But uh, let us know. Shoot, grab an email or me an email if that's something you're interested in. Because I think it's something we could look at doing. Uh, if It'd the, probably be like a mini one in, in between Alberta and BC somewhere, you know. Maybe in like Invermere or somewhere like in the center sort of where. No, it would no. probably be close to Calgary Airport. Yeah. I think. Really? Okay. Because I'd probably, someone would have to come here for it. I'd probably get Brad and Powell to go to the Nordic Spa. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. That would be good. In like March or something when it's like minus 30. Yeah. And you go from the steam room to the out in the cold. Yeah. And then somebody they have the, those cold pools there. Yeah. I was there 
in February, dude. Yeah. And it was fucking crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, you go sit was asking, in those chairs and they were full of snow. So mm-hmm. you'd just be like, yeah. Yeah. Somebody was asking too about Canadian stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we could look at something like that, but it all depends on if enough people are interested in it. We don't have nearly as many Canadian listeners as we do American listeners. It's like seriously 10 to 1. So. America.ca slash support, guys. We need your support. Can't do this without you. This is not a free show, a value for value show. If you're getting some value from the show, maybe it's making your commute better, your day at work better, your workout, wherever you listen. Let us know where you listen. And support. Buck a show, two bucks a show, a buck a month, three bucks a month, 50 bucks a month. You decide. America.ca slash support. Support the value for value model today. Adultbrain.ca for the audiobooks. GrandAmericaOutlaw.ca for the other podcast. Join the chats, GrandAmerica.ca slash chats. And of course, those events, again, are contact at thecabin.com. We love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week. I hear my soulmates whistling like a tea kettle, playing that seductive game, running through the meadow amongst the flower petals. Amongst the flower petals She likes to swing on the swing set Singing 90 sit songs na 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 90 sit songs How do you unfold your Music Have you got a Computer Synced up to an Auto-tuner Oh woo Got psychedelic in the summer. Man, it was a bummer. When the leaves turn black, when the leaves turn black, when the leaves turn black, I tried to reach you, but my limbs were broken. But my limbs were broken. How do you unfold your music? Have you got a Synced up to an auto-tuner oh, Like a light at the end of a tunnel I hear my soulmates whistling like a tea kettle Playing that seductive game Running through the meadow Amongst the flower petals Amongst the flower petals She likes to swing on the swing set Singing 90s hit songs The n n n n hit songs How do you unfold your music? Have you got a computer Synced up to an auto-tuner?
winner. I just love